Well, hello, welcome to Bridge Online. My name is Bethany. And my name is Paul, and we are so glad that you are here. Happy Easter. You know, we had a tradition in my house growing up where we would do an Easter egg hunt every year, but there was one egg that was the golden egg. In that egg, there was like $5. So we would do anything we could to find that egg. Did you have any traditions like that? You know, we did. We had the same thing, except our golden egg had it. $20. Oh, yeah. all right. Ooh. Big money over here. Well, hey, we would love to hear from you. If there's any traditions that you had, or maybe even something you love doing now, go ahead and drop that in the chat. We would love to hear about it this Sunday. Mm-hmm. That's right. It is Easter. And listen, today is a special day for followers of Jesus all around the world. And today we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the celebration would not be the same without you. So thanks for joining us today. And if it's your first time, will you do me one quick thing and let us know you're here. Simply drop a waving emoji in the chat so someone can say hello. And even though you may be alone today, there's a whole community of people joining you online and they would love to say hey. Before we begin, make sure that you take a moment to share the stream. Post it on Facebook, take a picture from where you're watching from, and tag us on social media. Just don't do church alone today. Mm-hmm. Well, we're about to jump in, so I encourage you to go grab your Bible and put away anything that would be distraction to your time of worship today.
angels cry, saints and angels glorify, and the echoes day and night, worthy. Eyes like fire, hair like wool, voice like many waters roar, vastness and most beautiful. years ago they crowned you with a crown of thorns today we crown you rightly with adoration and with praise church if you feel comfortable will you lift your hands with me can we just sing hallelujah
guys, he is alive. He is risen. And because he is alive, there is no place that you can be that he is not. On the top of the mountain, he is there. In the valley, he is there. In your moments of joy, he is there. And in your moments of mourning, he is there. But listen, church, in the tomb, he's not there. Amen? Come on, let's give him praise one more time. Hallelujah. Man, church, it's so good to worship together today. Hey, if you've been here for 20 years, or maybe today's your first time in church, I want you to know we're so glad that you're here. Will you do me a favor? Turn to your left and to your right. Give someone a fist bump. Tell them good morning. Say, he is risen. Then you can grab a seat. Glad to worship with you. Uh, if we haven't met yet, my name is Corey, and I'm part of our team here at The Bridge. And uh, some beautiful faces, some well-dressed people in the room here. Uh, greetings to those of you watching online as well. I want to say hello. Uh, I know that many of you here uh, are here at the 1 p.m. service because you usually attend a morning service, but you wanted to make room for some folks attending our morning Easter services. I just want to let you know, for the 9 and 11 a.m., we had more people in this building than we have ever had in this building. And so... Truly amazing. Uh, for both, I made over two overflows, and so I just want to say thank you if you made that missional move to create space. Hundreds of guests were able to sit in the space because uh, you made that move. So I want to say huge, huge thank you. I uh, also want to say thank, uh, welcome to a certain segment of those of you, and that's our first time guests. Bridge Camp fam, can we give it up to those for those who join us for the first time? That's amazing. Uh, if you are joining us for the first time, I want to say we firmly believe you are not here by accident. Uh, we have spent the last weeks and months praying for you, and so I want to say I'm so glad that you're here today. We are so glad that you're here today. If you are wondering what are we about here at the bridge, uh, we can put it pretty shortly. Uh, it's this. We are all about Jesus unashamedly, unabashedly about Jesus. We have this mission statement, which is we want to be with Jesus and become like him for the sake of the world. We, quite frankly, that is believe that is the best way that a person can spend their life. And I hope you hear that today, not just as a declaration, but also as an invitation. Because we believe that for every single one of you, God has a next step for you today. But we also hope that you just feel welcome in this space today. And to that end, if we can be helpful to you in any way, we have an incredible team of staff and volunteers. Just look for a name tag. If you need help on your way out, just leave service. Look for somebody with a name tag. We will be glad to help you. If you've got a kiddo in the room and at any point in time they get restless and they're like, this space is not for me anymore, mom or dad, uh, we've got a family lounge with a live stream of the service. And so simply walk up the uh, lobby doors and we'll walk you over there and make sure that you get uh, where you need to go. Uh, well, if you're looking to take a next step and maybe this is your first time, maybe you've been coming for a few weeks and you're like, what is my next step of involvement or how do I learn more about the bridge? We've got this thing called Open House, which is our intro class. And it is one of my favorite things that I get to do around here at the bridge. It is a chance for you to learn about our history and mission and vision and values and our ministries and our staff, meet some staff members, ask some questions in a dynamic environment. And so if you'd like to do that, we would love to save a spot for you. Next class will kick off. It's two parts, the April 7th, so next Sunday. Simply come back and then the following Sunday as well and learn about who we are and seek how God might be calling you to take a step. You can RSVP right now. Go to bridge.tv slash open house and we will save you a seat. Every Sunday we gather, we carve out time also to give back to God. Uh, and we do that for a few reasons. We believe that God is the source of every good thing that we have. And so when we give, it is an act of saying, God, thank you for all of the ways that you've provided for me. When we give, we are also praying, God, would you make me more like Jesus, who is the most generous person who ever lived? And as we give, we also are praying, God, use these gifts to change the world in a way that only you can. So if you'd like to participate uh, in our mission through giving today, you can do that in the black buckets as they pass down the row in just a moment. Or you can go to bridge.tv slash give and give online. But I just want to say thank you for being a really, really generous church. It makes all the difference in the world. 
Before we continue on with our service, uh, it is Resurrection Sunday, and we love telling stories of where God is bringing life where there was once death. And we've got a guy in our church named Jesus Mora who has got just such a story, and we wanted you to have a chance to hear it from him. So take a look. I remember my, my ex-wife and my daughter left for the afternoon and I stayed home and I took, I took some pills. And I knew exactly what they were gonna do or what they should have done, I'll say that. But then my ex-wife shows up and says, I just got called back into work, I need you to watch our daughter. I kind of went into a panic. I didn't say anything to her and I started to make myself throw up and I said, please God, don't let me die in front of my daughter. <laughs> Obviously I didn't. Originally, I was uh, born in South America when I was 11 years old. I, I came to the U.S. and uh, learned English, and uh, college wasn't for me at the time. So when I graduated high school, I went straight into the military. I did 16 years in the infantry to Iraq, Afghanistan, Kosovo, several times over. I knew God was real. I knew that. I'd seen it through my deployments, you know, through friends that I lost um, in the way, in the manner they, they died. Um, looking at it going like, you know, they did all the right things. They ran to the bunkers. They were wearing their gear. They were in the armor Humvees, um, and they still died. Um, and then you look at moments, you're like, I have no idea how you made it out of there in one piece. Like literally everything around you is on fire. After I left the service, I, uh, I was a cop for five years. During that time, I had just, I made a lot of stupid decisions when it came to relationships. I guess I was trying to numb them out. You know, I had uh, prescription pain pills uh, that I would a lot of times find myself taking them before bed with alcohol, and it was just a regular thing, you know, and then my drinking got elevated to where a lot of times if I was off shift, I would just be drinking. It wasn't until I woke up um, from rock bottom, basically. Um, one, of my, one of my good friends, I, uh, I called her one morning after I had, you know, drank and uh, taken some prescription pills. All she told me is, 9.30, small group, I'll see you there. And I showed up. So it was soon thereafter that I met my wife, Heather. Um, she was very active in the church at the time. So, you know, when I started turning to the, the positive things that Christ, you know, can do in my life, you know, things started really turning around. I have never doubted that God exists, but I didn't have that... I didn't have a relationship um, with God. I had an obligation to an institution and religion, um, which I knew wasn't healthy. I remember Ian was, uh, was talking about mental health and how, what role God plays in that. And uh, I have wrestled a lot with thoughts of suicide before. Oddly enough, that was baptism Sunday, so I just got up, I went to the back, I was in tears. Um, and it's, it's tough because from an intelligence standpoint, like you know, like you understand the concept, you know, like, Okay, this is this is scripture. The Bible says this, and this is the word of God. I get it. Okay, but after screwing up so many people's lives and having this effect and that effect, it doesn't pass the common sense of why would God forgive me for the things that I've done? And our humanity a lot of times tells us, well, if somebody did that to me, I wouldn't forgive them. Why would God forgive me? It's that cleansing 
of Jesus paid for your sins already. Like, stop being ashamed of them, stop carrying them, because he already paid the price. That day I, I made that outward expression of um, who I am, what I am, <sighs> belongs to God. You know, and he's just telling me, go and sin no more. And that's all I can do. I went from being empty to being full with grace and hope because of Jesus. Good morning, yeah, absolutely. Well, good morning, Bridge family. Happy Easter. I don't know if you heard, uh, but the tomb is empty. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I want to I want to give a very special welcome if you're joining us online, or in Murray or Perry County Jail. Can we make some serious noise for everyone that's joining us? <clears throat> we love you guys. And some of you know already, but a week and a half ago, we were actually in Murray County Jail, and we got to celebrate 33 people going public with their faith through baptism. Here's a photo right there, and. Uh, how awesome is that? Yeah. <clears throat> Man. And I, I tell you stories like that and the one that we just watched because I believe that God is going to change lives today. I, I believe that some of y'all are going to leave vastly different than when you came here today, uh, not because of a sermon or songs or a church, but because of what Jesus is doing uh, in and through us. And that's a really, really amazing thing to be a part of. Um, my name is Ian. If we haven't met, if we have met, my name is still Ian. It's consistent across the board. Um, we're going to be in Luke chapter 24. If you want to turn or swipe there now, you can. And something that we do every Sunday, is something a mentor taught me now a couple decades ago, that anytime we approach the Word of God, we begin first with prayer in this posture. And he would say, this is a posture both of letting go, but it's also it's a posture of receiving. And I don't know what you need to let go of today, and I don't know what you need to receive, but God does. So I'd love to invite you to this posture. I'll pray for us, and, uh, and then we'll dive right in. God, thank you for the gift of this moment of today, of breath in our lungs, God. Thank you for the story of Easter. Thank you for the empty tomb. Thank you for the resurrection. God, would you do something in us and through us that only you can do? Help us to let go of maybe what's been holding us back, what we've been clinging to, and help us to receive Holy Spirit from you today. May we leave differently as a result. We thank you, God, and we love you, and we pray all these things in the beautiful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Uh, have you ever looked at a, a photo and had to kind of do a double take? You ever seen something like maybe online and it, like takes your brain a second to like, what am I, what am I actually looking at? What is, here's what I mean. Here's a couple of examples. So for this, this first one, does this girl have really skinny legs or is she holding a bag of popcorn? <laughs> it's slowly washing over all of you. I can see the lights just getting turned. How about this one? Does this look like, uh, like an amazing concert? Raise your hand if this looks like an awesome concert to you. This is, or is it a combine collecting cotton in a field? Is that, <laughs> do you see it now? Yeah. It's weird when you kind of double take, you're like, oh, I see what's going on here. This one to me was really funny. Um, this woman posted a photo of a, uh, she was on an airplane <laughs> and the caption was, for this whole flight, I thought this guy was staring at me until I realized his sunglasses were on the back of his head. <laughs> you see it now, right? You're like, that's a little, that's a little creepy. Here's the, here's the last one. So with this right here, um, if, you, if you really look, if you look at this photograph, <laughs> uh, if you really focus your eyes, it's still a terrible band. That's the, uh, <laughs> today I want to talk about two people that almost missed Jesus entirely. Even though he was like right under their noses, right with them, they almost missed it. Now, personally, it is my conviction that Easter is all about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Full stop. If you're new or skeptical or unsure, like that's what we're about. In fact, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to a church in a city called Corinth. He said this. He says, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. I love how blunt that is. It's like, listen, if he's still in the tomb, 
None of this matters. Your preaching doesn't matter. Your small group ministry doesn't matter. Your mission trips don't matter. Your buildings don't matter. If Christ has not been raised, um, we all should just go home. Without the resurrection, there is no savior, no salvation, no forgiveness of sins, and no hope of eternal life. But here's the truth. Apart from the resurrection, Jesus was a very good but very dead man. So we anchor all of it. Today is about the resurrection of Jesus. And maybe you're here today and you're like, I'm not sure that I buy all of this church Bible Jesus stuff, which by the way, if that's you, man, I'm, I am sincerely so glad that you're here or joining us online. Like, I hope that you keep showing up. At the very least, it is, it is hard to argue that Jesus wasn't and isn't massively significant. Now, that name Jesus means God saves. And Christ was not a last name, by the way. It means anointed one of God. But Jesus of Nazareth was born to a poor teenage girl. His father was a peasant builder. He never traveled more than 200 miles away from the small rural town that he was born in. Never sold a book. Never ran a company. Never had kids. He spent, in fact, the first 30 years of his life in relative obscurity. Died at the age of 33, eight years younger than I am right now. And yet no one has transformed the world more. Regardless of how you feel about him, no one has shaped history more than Jesus. In his wake is the largest le legacy in the history of the world. More songs have been sung, paintings made, books sold about him than anyone else in history. Even think about B.C. A.D. B.C. stands for before Christ. A.D. Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. History literally hinges on this man. Now when Jesus rose from the dead... Those in Jerusalem and Judea did what we would all do if we saw someone executed, witnessed them being buried, and then were having breakfast with them a few days later. They talked about it, and they wrote about it. We believe that this is real because real people witnessed it and wrote about it, and they believed it. Four historical accounts of the resurrection. Matthew was an eyewitness and believed it. Mark got his information from Peter, an eyewitness who believed it. Luke, who thoroughly researched his gospel account, believed it. And John, a close friend and an eyewitness, also believed it. In fact, we even have like other historical examples outside of Scripture that I think are really compelling. Tiberius, Julius Africanus, Phlegon, and Thallus all confirmed either darkness or an earthquake at the time of Jesus' death. At the very least, something happened there, something significant. There's a man named Celsus, who was a second century Greek philosopher and a Fierce opponent of Christianity, by the way. He was not Team Jesus. Made the first comprehensive attack on Christianity, trying to resolve why Jesus was able to successfully perform miracles. What is it about this Jesus that is able to do these things? But I think that maybe the most compelling is a man named James. James was the brother of Jesus. And let me just ask you, what would your brother have to do to convince you he was God? Most of us have enough data points on our brother to be like, That's, this is never going to fly. In fact, we know that prior to the crucifixion, like James was not a believer. Did not believe Jesus who says, was who he says he was. And then following the resurrection, not only becomes a believer, becomes a leader in the early church. So much so that he's martyred for his faith. How does that happen? Today, at the very least, I want you to consider the resurrection of Jesus. Because most religions in the world are kind of anchored or built on either a philosophy or a series of teachings. Christianity is built on an event. It's the event that we celebrate with literally millions upon millions of Christ followers around the globe that the tomb is empty. But apart from the resurrection, Jesus was a very good but very dead man. Now I want to give a little bit of context to the Easter story and I think this is helpful for all of us, whether you've heard this or not. I think this context kind of sets the stage. So ancient Jews believed that God was going to send the Messiah to restore Israel to its previous glory. That is what a lot of them had kind of in their mind was this previous glory that this Messiah, whoever it was, would restore them to. But year after year, nothing. Fast forward to the first century. The people of God, the Israelites, are now under the boot of Rome. And then this like strange rabbi comes on the scene. Like, he preaches with authority, but he also preaches, like, in, like, parables and stories, and at, like, one point he takes a coin out of a fish's mouth, and people are like, what is, what is this? What's going on? It's strange. But crowds began to gather, and it, this makes the authorities nervous. And then Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, and that was kind of the last straw. 
Jesus was then betrayed by a close friend, condemned by the temple, crucified by the empire, prepared for burial, and sealed in a tomb. And at this point, the game seemed over. If you're a church person, it can be really difficult to sit in this because we, like, we know how the story ends. But imagine being a follower when all of this went down and you see Jesus sealed in a tomb. That's it. There's no movement to keep alive. There's no story to keep telling. And here's how Luke records what happens next in Luke 24. It says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. Now, each of the gospel accounts reference slightly differently the time of day, but I think it's really interesting. John said, while it was still dark. Matthew said, it was just before dawn. Mark said, as the sun was rising. All of them are saying, Easter happens when it's still dark. Resurrection still happens when we can't yet see the light at the end of the tunnel. Easter, resurrection, new life happens when it's still dark. Now, it also says that it happened on the first day of the week. In the Bible, uh, this is significant. The first day always marks the beginning of something new. It's a restart. It's a new chapter. Easter marks the end of a previous era and the beginning of something new entirely. So again, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of these women, which, by the way, women were the first to show up at the empty tomb. That's significant. And they saw their friend executed, So they're bringing spices, and why are they bringing spices? It was not because they were like anticipating cooking dinner with Jesus. They brought spices to anoint his body in the grave. Put another way, they were fully expecting a body. That's why they're at the tomb with spices. What happens next is they found the stone rolled away, but no body. The stone weighing somewhere between two and 4,000 pounds with a guard uh, protecting the tomb. And two men in clothes like lightning are standing there, and they ask, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Which is such a good question. I think it's one worth wrestling today. Like, why, why do you look for life in dead places? Some of us know that all too well. We've gone to dead places looking for life only to come up empty. That is the good news of Easter, that he's not there. And then women again are the first to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus. He's not dead, he's alive. He rose from the dead. And it's not simply a story that we remember. He offers us new life here and now. Resurrected life, more on that in a second. Now that's often where the the Bible story of Easter tends to end. Many of you have probably heard some version of those accounts. But there's a story a few verses later that I want to spend a little time talking about because I I think there's a really compelling illustration, but also a picture and challenge for us today. Uh, It's probably worth noting that at the news that the women are sharing, some of the disciples are amped. Some of them are thrilled. They can't believe it. Others, though, like, just can't bring themselves to believe it. Like, this sounds too good to be true. The rumors began to spread that the body of Jesus was missing from the tomb, and so people started to wonder, did someone take it? Did the disciples steal it? Was Mary mistaken? Was Jesus really resurrected? And then we come to a story of two men who, after the crucifixion, understandably, were heartbroken, as any of us would be. And they're hearing all these rumors, and they decide, like, this is just, this is too much. And that brings us to verse 13 of chapter 24. It says, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing them. So what are they talking about? They're talking about what any of us would be talking about, right? All of this with Jesus was sort of all anyone could talk about. And again, I want you to put yourself in their shoes. They have likely sold everything to follow this rabbi. And not only that, they've left their home, they've left their family. They, they have gone all in that Jesus is the Messiah, and then he's executed. Like, imagine the devastation of, of like, getting your hopes up and then being like, this is not how I thought the story would end. And you begin to hear some stories, but, like, you're, like, maybe one of them, you think, enough is enough. And they pack up their stuff, and they head out. And on this road, do they see Jesus? Yeah. But do they recognize Jesus? No. And those are two very different things. 
It is my presumption that many of us see Jesus but don't recognize it as him. And that's the story I want to talk about today. So Jesus was there, and they don't recognize him. And I actually don't know why they can't recognize him. Maybe it was their disillusionment. Maybe it was their disappointment. Maybe it was their discouragement. And maybe that's something that keeps us from seeing Jesus today. Maybe we're so steeped in the way that we thought life would go that it's hard for us to see the activity of God right under our noses. Either way, they were not aware that Jesus was walking with them. And just to say it, like this is maybe a weird thing to say on Easter Sunday, um, it is my conviction that what you all need is not one more sermon. What we need is not one more song, one more idea, one more construct. I would argue what every single one of us needs is to see Jesus for who he really is. To have our eyes open to, as the King James reads, to behold Jesus. That is what all of us ultimately need. And here we see that God meets us in our circumstances, right where we're at on the road. Now, Jesus could have done a lot of things. This is his first day of being resurrected. I don't know about you, I wouldn't have spent it walking seven miles. It's no knock to you power walkers. Like, I know that that's your jam. Not for me. I am not... Like, think about it. Jesus could have appeared to the highest court in the land, could have appeared to Caesar in Rome. He could have appeared to the Jewish leaders of the Sanhedrin or the temple. But interestingly, he spends a great portion of his first day as resurrected king simply walking down a road with these two disciples. Now, the road to Emmaus is a a seven-mile, two-and-a-half-hour journey that leaves Jerusalem. It represents those who followed Jesus as far as they could. But now they're in shock. Now, now their hearts are heavy, and they begin walking away from Jerusalem. They knew all the right things, but it had not taken hold of their heart. My guess is that explains a lot of us today. Maybe, maybe you're hearing like, I know all the Jesusy stuff. I can even quote the verses, and I know when to raise my hand. I know how to do the church thing, but maybe, maybe you haven't actually beheld Jesus. You've not surrendered your heart to him. And maybe you're at a place like these t- disciples where you're like, now all we have are these stories. And they're like intriguing, maybe a little convicting. But maybe you're somewhere on this road too. Maybe you're somewhere on this road walking away from hope in between everything you expected and what you still long for. That's what Emmaus is. So Jesus is on this road with these travelers. And the question is, I think, worth asking, why? Why is he Why of all the things he could be doing is he doing this? I think there are a lot of answers, but here's the one that I'm most compelled by. I think he was modeling something for us because the truth is every single one of us is on a road, myself included. We are all on a journey of some kind, and there are many of us who, while we have heard about Jesus, have not yet actually comprehended who he is. And this is the heart of Jesus. Jesus wants to know you personally and for you to know him personally and he has always been the one that came to seek people on their journey the story goes on verse 17 jesus asked them what are you discussing together as you walk along which i love the irony of this because like jesus already knows the answer but he's he's often asking questions this is kind of jesus's jam in fact of the uh, in the gospels of the 183 questions he asked he answers only three of them isn't that interesting And yet, in turn, he asks 307 questions of others. Jesus loves kind of peeling back the curtain and asking people questions to get to the heart of what's really going on. Then it goes on, verse 17b, it says, They stood still, their faces downcast, their heart broken by the news. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Again, let's, can we not miss the humor of this situation? Like, it's, the irony is so thick. Not only does Jesus know what happened, he is what happened. He's, he's aware because he is the thing. But what does he do when he joins them on the journey? He doesn't make some kind of declaration. What does he do first? He asks them a question. Jesus, on their journey asks them a question, and then actually listens. Christians, we have not done a great job in this area. 
it, is it possible that maybe we don't see the activity of God as much as we would like because we are so busy beating people over the head with our Bibles that we haven't stopped to actually listen? To ask people about their pain, their disillusionment, what makes you, you, how did you end up at this, po- this part of the journey? I think this interaction here teaches us a lot about the invitation of Jesus. He shows that it starts by walking with them on their journey and actually asking them questions. Sometimes we want to skip this step. But Jesus shows us in this story just how important it is. And then he goes on, verse 19. What things? He asked. <laughs> I'm glad you're like laughing because like, I can't, I read this as like, I like to call it sassy Jesus, right? Like, can't you kind of hear it in his tone? Like he's going to give a little side eye. He's like, mm-hmm, what thing? I don't, know, I don't think he's doing this, but... <laughs> You know, like, mm. <laughs> what thing? He's almost like egging them on. And again, Jesus knows, but he keeps asking the question. What I love here is that Jesus doesn't begin with a proclamation, but a question. What are you discussing? What are you talking about? What is this conversation you're having? And this is how they answer. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. So these two sort of show their hands now at this point. And I think this is why they can't recognize Jesus for who he is. They had hoped something, that Jesus would come as a leader that would restore Israel to its previous glory. And to them, crucifixion doesn't look like a victory. It looks like an end of the story, right? Right? We had hoped that this would be the guy. But Jesus gives them space to share their pain, share their disappointment. But I want us to focus in on three simple words that they had said. We had hoped. I'm just guessing, but I think a lot of us can relate to those three words. Maybe not right now. Maybe it's something in the past. Maybe it's something you'll face in the future. After 20 years of being in ministry, though, the amount of times I've heard we had hoped, I've lost count of. Maybe you can relate to that feeling. We had hoped the tumor wasn't malignant. We had hoped our marriage would last. We had hoped our child would come home. We had hoped the depression would lift. We had hoped it would have healed by now. We had hoped to carry the baby to term. I think a lot of us, whether we admit it or not, are wearing the weight of we had hoped. And God doesn't seem to be coming through. And so as followers of Jesus, we walk alongside people on the Emmaus Road, not as experts, but as humans, as sinners, strugglers, pointing people to a better way, even if it looks like foolishness. In fact, Paul says the cross looks a lot like foolishness if you haven't beheld Jesus, if you don't understand what this is all about. So then these travelers explained that the women had told them the tomb was empty and that other people had also seen the same, but there was no Jesus. And then Jesus offers this like interesting kind of gentle rebuke and then he teaches them from scripture. Verse 26, did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And on that first Easter, Jesus is making himself known through Scripture. No amount of intellect or philosophy or illustrations apart from the Bible will make us understand what the resurrection is actually about. No one in the story had a clue until he begins to teach from the Bible. What is the message of Easter? Not simply that someone rose from the dead. Lazarus was raised from the dead. The message is that the crucified one rose from the dead. The one who was made sin on our behalf, the one who stood in our place, the one who was rejected by the world. So when we come to those words, we had hoped. We recognize that our hope isn't simply in what these eyes can see, but in a truth greater, far beyond our comprehension. Because a dead Messiah cannot bring liberation for anybody. If he was still in the grave, none of this matters. The resurrection, though, is the declaration that the debt has been paid. It is the great reversal that suffering does not have the last word and that we walk free with him. 
And then in the kind of final movement of the story, then Jesus is revealed in a very interesting way, in a very interesting place, at the table. Verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were, what's the word? Opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. So as they were approaching the village, Jesus, I love this part of the story, he sort of like pretends that he's, he has to keep going further, and the two travelers say, it's much too late for that. Come, come stay with us. And when was the last time that Jesus did this with bread? It's Passover. It's the Last Supper. He takes the bread, breaks it, and gives it to them. The symbols that he gave them to internalize the story of his broken body and shed blood. He's hidden on the road, but revealed at the table. This is when the lights come on. God is present at the table. He is known in the breaking of bread, in meal sharing, in sharing food with friends and enemies. Jesus is best known in community. Not when we go off to some ivory tower to kind of like achieve some sort of intellectual ascent. The disciples on the road connect the word and the meal and their eyes were opened around the table and their lives were never the same. In fact, when they realized who it was, they then rushed back to Jerusalem to proclaim the good news. This is what gospel means, by the way. It's not just a style of music. It is good news. We are witnesses of this good news. Think about that. A seven-mile journey in the evening with the day almost over. But they were eager to share, and so should we be. When we recognize Jesus in our midst, when our eyes are open, when we behold him and his activity in our lives and our world, we should always go with a sense of urgency to share with those around us. The resurrection is not just simply for some kind of far off future reality and not just simply a historical story that we remember, but it's for right here and now. Way too many of us have bought into the notion that Jesus only simply provides some kind of afterlife when we stop breathing on planet Earth. And I'm here to tell you it is way better than that. It's for resurrected life right now. In fact, the primary word that Jesus uses over and over again as a synonym for salvation is the word life. He says in John 10, 10, I have come that they may have, what's the word? Life. And have it to the full. Have it abundant. The greatest miracle that he can do in our life is not to change our circumstances, but to change our heart in the midst of our circumstances. To see Jesus in the midst of our circumstances. The the abundant life, I'm here to tell you, is not when everything is good. When everything is up and to the right, when this quarter is better than last quarter, it's when we're in the midst of our Emmaus journey and Jesus shows up and we see him and we recognize him. What Jesus offered to his first followers, he offers to us today a life that is truly life. But even though we live in an Easter world, I think, I think a lot of us are still living a Good Friday reality. And I I have no idea what kind of story or road you're walking. Maybe, Maybe like these disciples, you're just convinced the story's over. That there's nothing left to do but accept the inevitable. Maybe the thing that you're clinging to is something unexpected in your marriage or your career or your health or your finances, your relationships. Maybe it's the opposite. Maybe you're like on the top of the world right now and yet you have this like nagging sense that this isn't fulfilling the way that I thought it would. I achieved everything I was hoping for, hoping it would fill some kind of void and it has not yet delivered. Either way, Easter means that nothing is impossible with God, that life triumphs over death, that love triumphs over hatred, that hope triumphs over despair, and that suffering does not have the last word. Even if, if, if it took everything in you to even be here today, He is a God who journeys with us, who meets us on the road. And even if you are in the valley and all you can feel is emptiness, I would say this an empty tomb means you don't have to live an empty life. Jesus is not just simply the door to some afterlife in the future. It's the invitation to new creation possibilities right here and now. 
So here's my invitation. It's not clever. It's not all that unique. The invitation is to say yes to Jesus. Maybe for the first time, but also maybe for the millionth time. Maybe you said yes years ago, but you're realizing, man, I'm on my own Emmaus Road right now. I'm walking away from hope. Maybe I'll give this church thing one last try. Maybe I'll go all in with Jesus. Saying yes to Jesus is not just knowing him, but following him, surrendering to him, and trusting him. Maybe this is the first time anyone's ever asked you to consider this. Maybe you've been asked that before, but you never thought that you were enough, that your past was too much. Wherever you are at on this road, you are invited. So I want to ask you to to do something real quickly. If you would, just take out your smartphones. If you have a smartphone, if not, there's some cards in the seat back in front of you you can use. But I would love for everyone to do this. If you would go to bridge.tv slash survey, and you're given four options there. I'd love for everyone to do this, even if you're here with a, a spouse or family. If every, if every person can do this, select one of these four options. It'll take you to a short form. I'd love for you to fill it out. But here, here's what each of these means. And this is just our way to kind of serve you, pray for you. A is I'm already a believer. And we'll say, praise God. We're so glad. Whether this is your church home or you're visiting, whatever. B is I want to become a follower of Jesus. Maybe you're realizing, like, I've been kind of, like, observing Jesus. I've been a learner of Jesus, but I've not actually become a follower. If that's you today, if there's a a sense that the Holy Spirit has been tugging at your heart, I'd love for you to hit B, and we would love to come alongside you. Maybe you're here and you're, like, interested. Like, I'm not not sure that all my questions have been answered yet, but I'm at least intrigued. I'd I'd like to consider it more. We would love to reach out and just simply have a conversation with you. And lastly, maybe you're like, I don't intend to do any of that. Would you still hit D? And if you're willing, we would love, we would love to pray with you and for you in any way that you would want. And none of this is not signing you up on a mailing list. But we'll, we'll reach out to you one time and just try to love on you and try to serve you as best as we possibly can. But I want you to know that we exist as a church to be with Jesus and become like him for the sake of the world. And we can do any of that because the debt has been paid. In fact, if you were to put it on a receipt, it would look something like this. Your sin, your shame, your pain, your mistakes, your rejection, your slavery to sin, it's all, it's paid for by the blood of Jesus. This is the gospel of good news. That those of us who keep trying to earn or deserve or merit to impress God somehow, to, to figure out a way in for him to, whatever that looks like for you, the debt has been paid and you are invited. You are invited. If you're single, married, divorced, widowed, rich or poor, you're invited. The fussy infants and the gray-haired veterans, you're invited. If you can sing like an angel, couldn't carry a tune in a bucket, you're invited. If your church shopping just woke up, just got out of jail or is still in jail, you're invited. If you're more religious than the Pope or haven't been to church since Aerosmith was good, you're invited. (laughs) If you're over 70 but not grown up yet or a teenager that's growing up too fast, you're invited. We invite you soccer moms, ESPN dads, starving artists, tree huggers, oat, almond, soy, cashew, latte sippers, vegans, junk food eaters, you're invited. The invitation is for those who are currently in recovery or still addicted. Regardless of your sexual past, proclivity, or orientation, you're invited. You're invited if your heart is heavy, light, or downright in the dumps. If you're left wing, right wing or you don't care for the bird at all you're invited we welcome those who don't love organized religion or had Christianity shoved down their throats you're invited you're invited if you work too hard work too little or don't work at all if you're inked pierced both or neither you're invited you're invited if you could desperately use prayer right now were guilted by grandma to come today or got lost in traffic and wound up here by mistake 
We invite tourists, seekers, doubters, zealots, bleeding hearts, and you. You're invited. Because no matter what road you are on, Jesus catches up to us. So keep walking, keep listening, look for him, listen for him. And when he lingers at your door, simply say, stay with me. May our eyes be opened so that we can recognize Jesus in our midst. May our hearts burn with joy as we see our story wrapped up in his. And may we always be eager to share the joy of his resurrection and presence among us to the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of the empty tomb. Now, we don't worship a philosophy or a construct or even a set of teachings, but the risen Christ. And God, for those of us who feel crushed beneath the weight of we had hoped, would you help us to take those and place them on the shoulders of Jesus? Help us to surrender our lives for the first time or the millionth time completely to you, God. And help us to do what you do for us, to walk with others along their roads too. We thank you 